It's great to have everyone here for today's webinar, Making Strategic Decisions in the Context of COVID-19. I'm Dan Cardinale and I'm President and CEO of Independent Sector. And I really just wanna thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is a members only event and we're really delighted to partner with Monitor by Deloitte uh, in this uh, project. It's a, an important moment. Before we get started, we do wanna just do a little bit of housekeeping as we always do, right? Um, we're using the Zoom platform. Most of you are deeply familiar with it. You have full functionality. So we're gonna ask you to stay muted if you're not speaking. And for those that uh, are comfortable to put your video on so you can be seen and, and participate. If you have questions during the presentation, please put those in the chat box. Um, pretty straightforward. We will be doing breakouts and during that time you'll be able to have kind of regular interaction uh, in small groups. But during the presentation it's easier just to have that flow through the chat box. Um, and while we're setting up, I'd really invite folks to kind of uh, put in the chat box now who you are, what your organization is, where you're coming from, and if you have you know a couple of words about what you hope to get out of today, that would be helpful uh, for the team. Um, to make sure that we're trying to get to what folks really care about in real time. And then finally, as always, we have a survey at the end of this webinar and it would be fantastic if you take the time to fill that out. It helps us then be really responsive to you and what would be most helpful. All right, so before we move into the content, I want to respectfully acknowledge that I am joining you today from Washington, DC, and that is the ancestral home of the Nakatach, Anacostan, and Piscataway people who still live in this area and are working to reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also want to acknowledge that we are in a city um, and inhabit buildings here in Washington that were built with labor of enslaved people. And as we begin, we want to also take a moment of silence uh, to really honor the more than 180,000 people who have lost their lives to COVID-19 in the country alone and the countless others who have suffered at the hand of injustice in our communities. Thank you. So today I am really delighted and excited uh, to be holding this event in partnership with the Monitor Institute by Deloitte. We will have a robust discussion to unpack a set of scenarios uh, that come out of this new report. And I would really commend the report to you if you haven't read it, to take the time. It was, uh, it's really an impressive piece of work and I think very important for anybody who is leading or uh, co-leading in the, the social sector. The name of the report is called An Event or an Era, Resources for Social Sector Decision-Making in the Context of COVID-19. We here at Independent Sector uh, are really pleased to have participated in the lead up to the report. And we believe there are many important elements that any organization planning for the next several months or years needs to factor into their strategic planning, their fundraising, their community engagement, and really thinking about what the role of their organization will be in a murky future. The report is uh, a fine piece of uh, thoughtful engagement with about 75 social sector leaders. Um, who are all managing in this COVID-19 crisis. The interviews that were done by the Deloitte Monitor team um, took place between April and May of this year. Um, and they, in their discussions with us, really told us how widely different people saw the future. So there really is a wide range of scenarios people are carrying in their minds. I know that uh, we at Independent Sector participated and I found the conversations deeply thought provoking and helped me just in the very process of the questions being asked to think about the future of the sector and what we at Independent Sector could and should be doing to support the sector in driving impact forward. What we also heard and saw in the report is that some leaders were planning for an event. They saw this as episodic and discreet while others were preparing for categorical change and the birth of a new era in our country. This scenario planning work that was done um, is to help us as leaders to think about the future that is rooted in the recognition that even in the best of times, we don't really act, have any kind of accurate way to anticipate what comes ahead. It's always a guessing and a kind of scenario planning. 
but we can begin to imagine multiple pictures of the future. And that's the goal of today. And begin to rehearse in our minds and with each other, what might be the impact of our organization in a range of different kinds of scenarios that play themselves out. So enough said from me, I get to join in now and I'm really happy to turn it over to our colleagues and friends, Gabriel Casper, who is a managing director and Jen Hulk, who is a manager at Monitor Institute to kind of walk us through the scenario and guide us through our discussions. Over to both of you, thank you. Great. Gabriel is muted. Uh, I, can everyone hear me now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, as Dan said, I'm Gabe. I'm a managing director from the Monitor Institute by Deloitte. I am a futurist by training uh, and have spent most of the last two and a half decades helping funders and nonprofits think about how I think about the future of philanthropy and the broader social sector. And then Jen, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Jen Hulk. Um, I am not a futurist by training, but I'm an educator by training. So I worked with newcomers, um, emerging bilingual students, and then students with special needs prior to transitioning to the Monitor Institute. And I'm really looking forward to talking with all of you. Um, today, during our conversation, we are just to briefly give you a roadmap of where we're going. We're in welcome and Zoom reminders now, um, so we'll do some quick practice with that. We'll share for about 20 or so minutes about the report, some of the things that we've learned, um, questions that we still have. Um, but what we're really excited about is breaking out into smaller groups and getting the opportunity to think about how this applies to your organization, to your work, to your thinking about the future. And then we'll come back together to share a couple of thoughts uh, before we close out for the day. Um, and so uh, I know that Dan already talked a bit about Zoom reminders, but I'm a big fan of the annotate feature in addition to all of the wonderful chats that I've seen up to this point. And so if you haven't used that before, um, you should have a lovely view options up at the top of your page where you can click on annotate and we'll be using the, the stamp feature, which you can see circled and then the star to get a flavor of some of your perspective over the course of this session. Um, usually at this point, someone has already dotted the screen with the stars. So you guys are clearly very advanced that you did not do that. Um, but we do want to make sure that it's working for folks. So if you could take a second to answer this question, um, what is your favorite way to spend your free time at the moment? Walks, reading, cooking, new hobbies, um, what free time perhaps will be a popular option? Okay. I see, I see we've got stars all over the place. Um, well, glad to know that that is working and um, I'll go ahead and clear that out. And then we can go ahead and, and Gabriel get dive into the conversation. Sure. Uh, so our session today is uh, about th this new report, an event or an era, uh, which you'll find a link for in the group chat. Uh, if, if not already, we'll put it up there. Uh, it's a new resource for nonprofit and foundation leaders aimed at helping you to make strategic decisions in the midst of the COVID crisis. Uh, for us, this started back in uh, uh, the work on this project started back in March when we realized that a lot of the funders and nonprofits we were speaking with and working with were really struggling as COVID-19 hit. Uh, nonprofits that had weathered the initial storm were feeling paralyzed and trying to figure out how to adapt uh, their, their programs, their operating models to new realities. The round of emergency grant making, but we're really struggling to figure out what the heck they should do next. And we realized that the highest and best things we could be doing at the Monitor Institute was to use the tools we've been trained on as futurists to help nonprofits and funders get unstuck. They're thinking about, uh, in the, about COVID and how they operate. 
uh, uh, during COVID. Uh, Deloitte Consulting, uh, where, where, which we are, are sort of a small piece of, made a significant pro bono investment that allowed us to do a sector-wide scenario planning project specifically focused on helping nonprofits and funders figure out what to do uh, in these difficult days. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Monitor Institute, it's worth uh, explaining we are uh, sort of halfway between a consultancy and think tank focused on philanthropy and social change that operates as part of the, the, the company Deloitte. Our roots actually come from a futures thinking tradition at an organization called the Global Business Network. Uh, GBN, as it was called, as called uh, really pioneered the art of scenario planning. And that futures orientation has been central to our work at the Monitor Institute for nearly two decades now. For those of you who don't know it or aren't familiar, especially familiar with it, Scenario planning is a structured way of thinking about the future that's rooted in the recognition that even in the best of times, we can't really anticipate what's gonna come ahead. No one can predict the future, but we can begin to prepare for the many different futures that might, uh, might emerge, as Dan mentioned in his introduction. Uh, most of the time, organizations operate with what we call an official or an expected future in mind. You can see that on the left on this slide. Uh, and at best, organizations will do financial contingency planning. They'll think about best or mid or worst case scenario scenarios for what their revenues will look like. And that's an important thing to do. But this disruption with COVID is much more than just financial. And that sort of contingency planning typically looks at variations using the same basic set of assumptions about what the future would look like, just different revenue streams. Scenario planning teaches us that since we don't know what the future will unfold, what future, how the future will unfold, even in the best of times, we need to prepare in, in a way that looks at the range of possible futures that could emerge. Scenario planning as a practice comes from the 1970s when scenario planners at Royal Dutch Shell, the oil company actually, used scenario planning to prepare for different futures that might come for them. And while most of their competitors assumed that prices would continue to follow standard assumptions uh, about supply and demand, Shell really practiced what they might do in a variety of different circumstances. So when the oil embargo came in 1973 and suddenly prices were thrown off dramatically from what people had expected, Shell was actually prepared in a way that no one else was. And they jumped from just being a secondary player to being the second largest oil and gas company in the country. And we want to use that, that same idea of scenario planning and those tools to help funders and nonprofits take those tools and apply it to our specific context and how we're thinking about managing through the COVID crisis. So as Dan mentioned, we spoke to over 80 folks, um, social sector leaders over the past few months to understand how they were managing, what they thought about the future. And the aim of this was to really put together a mosaic of many different perspectives from across the field. And we wanted to be able to give you a flavor of what we heard from some of those people today. And so the first one, here's a quote from Tulane Montgomery, who works for the venture philanthropy group, New Profit. She said, we're all facing the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Some of us are in duct tape racks and others are in reinforced cruiser ships, and there's really no comparing the vessels. She was talking about the disproportionate impacts that this crisis has had on certain communities. The next quote, we're, dealing, we're now dealing with three crises at the same time, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and a social justice crisis. This came from Mario Marino, who launched Venture Philanthropy Partners. And he was thinking about how these different crises really interact um, and compound with one another as a big part of what would matter for our report and how we think about the future. Um, and finally, my personal favorite from Anthony Bug Levine, CEO of the Nonprofit Finance Fund. He talked about how important it is to lead with our values, even if we're not sure what's going to happen. Um, he said, I have no idea what's going to happen, but 
I know what I'm going to fight for. And that belief and really his clarity around what he's trying to do, I think is critical for all of us as funders or as nonprofits or supporting organizations um, to hold on to in the coming years. So scenario planning typically revolves around uncertainties, which we'll get into in just a second. But before we go there, we realize that in this moment, it may actually be even more important to be thinking about the certainties that we do, the things that we really do know amidst the craziness of this moment. Uh, and it's worth noting that COVID is turning what? many things. I think just someone just joined. Is that what happened? Uh, Oh, let me just continue. It's worth noting that COVID is turning many of the things that we once thought were certain on their heads a uh, few months. And, and so we've stopped calling these things certainties and started calling them prudent assumptions. These are the realities that we need to reckon with as we move ahead. And we think it's critical for the social sector to face these new realities. Uh, one way of describing this idea of prudent assumptions, uh, our old colleague, Catherine Fulton, who was the former head of the Monitor Institute uh, and was one of our advisors on this project, she likened the importance of this sort of reckoning uh, to the newspaper industry where she had her roots. She said, when the internet began to change the newspaper industry and really broke the advert model that it depended on, newspapers were stalled for a really long time. And it wasn't until they really reckoned with the fact that the old advertising model wasn't coming back, it wasn't going to work, that they could really move forward and move and innovate in their approach. And in a similar way, we think that the social sector has a bunch of things that it needs to reckon with. Uh, we see at least five new that we think people uh, can use both as guide rails, but also as uh, sort of reality checks as, as you move ahead. And so I'm going to dive into each of them really quick here. Uh, so the first is that uh, one Jen mentioned a little bit earlier, the pandemic is going to intersect with and compound with lots of other ongoing. So the crisis is accelerating a lot of things that were already underway in society from telehealth to remote work, but it's also widening a lot of the fissures and flaws in our system, especially, especially longstanding health and educational disparities that will play out against the backdrop of the crisis. And it's that notion of the backdrop that's really a, a, important to pay attention to. Consultant, a consultant by the name of Venkatesh Rao wrote that COVID is no longer just the lead story these days. It's actually the backdrop for almost every other story right now. Uh, so, for example, the racial justice protests that are happening uh, around the country, they're happening with masks and social distancing, with the, uh, with the tension and, and, and disparities of COVID behind them. And it's important to understand that COVID has become not just the front story, but a piece of every other story at the same time. The second really important prudent assumption is that the need for nonprofit source services is going to dwarf the available capacity and resources. Even if the pandemic magically ended tomorrow, we'd still be facing massive resource gaps and dealing with the fallout of the last several months. So nonprofits are going to have to face real limits about whose needs get prioritized and what quality of services can be provided. The third of the, of, of the prudent assumptions is that a significant number of nonprofits will be forced to consolidate or close their doors. We don't yet know how much, but early estimates of the contraction by uh, Candid and others suggest that it could range from 10% uh, to as high as 40%. And it's important that nonprofits and funders recognize that this is one of the realities that we're going to be living with. The fourth of the prudent assumptions is the impact from the crisis is going to fall disproportionately on communities of color and other marginalized populations. It's really exacerbated in, uh, existing in, inequalities. Uh, and without active intervention, our communities are going to come out with even wider uh, inequities and a really disproportionate sets of issues in different places. And finally, the last of the, uh, the, the prudent assumptions that we think it's really important to reckon with is that differences in outbreak rates and reopening strategies and the other 
other differences in place will cause really varying levels of crisis and need across geographies and across time. So that means that it's very easy for people to uh, experience a fundamentally different crisis than others are. People out here in the Bay Area where I live are experiencing the crisis very differently than Tulsa where Jen lives. Uh, so with those, those, that set of, of or prudent assumptions in mind, it's also important to recognize that there's fun really uncertain right now. There's, in fact, there's a lot, there, there, there's almost nothing that isn't uncertain. We looked at a lot of these different uncertainties and identified what we thought were the five that were most critical to thinking about where the social sector was headed. Those are the length and severity of the pandemic, which is really about the health side of the crisis and how the virus plays out. The length and severity of the economic downturn, which is related, but not necessarily the same uh, and not necessarily in lockstep with the health crisis. Government's response and the strength of the public social safety net and, uh, and, and how, how the government responds will actually determine a lot about how the social sector needs to respond. Fourth, the impact of technology on operating models and how the social sector is able to manage the transition to more digital uh, approaches. And finally, the level of social cooperation across communities, which is how we hold together as a society. You know, are we going to come together or are we gonna remain factionalized? And we know there'll never be this sort of kumbaya moment where we all come together the best we can usually do these days is 60% agreement on anything. Uh, but uh, the degree to which our communities have social cooperation becomes really important to understand. And there's a lot of more detail uh, underneath each of these uncertainties. And there are a lot of others that we identified over the course of our work. But these really felt like the five most critical for the sector to come to terms with over the coming months and years. Yeah. And so after we have these prudent assumptions and these critical uncertainties, like what do you actually do with them in order to create scenarios and to paint that picture of what the future could look like? And so looking at those uncertainties, we then narrowed it down to the two that we felt were most critical based on our conversations with social sector leaders. Um, we chose the two that we thought would be useful, but also practical that they would paint vivid pictures of four very different worlds. Um, and in doing this, we also hoped that it would be provocative and push people out of their current ways of thinking. Um, so the two axes that we chose, the first is the severity of the crisis. And when we talk about this, we mean both the viral or health impact, but also the severity of the economic crisis. Basically, what is the level of the state of emergency in different communities? Um, and so before I talk about social cooperation, I, I'd love to know what you think. Um, we talked earlier about having an expected future or where you think um, the future will unfold. I'd love for everyone to take a minute and with that handy dandy star feature, um, tell us on this severity of the crisis axis, where do you expect things to play out in terms of the impact um, to communities? Is it on the higher end, the lower end, somewhere in between? Um, and there's some descriptors underneath to help. Okay. Oh, there's less of a range here than there was, I think, the last time we had this conversation. Okay. Okay, so it, it looks like for most people, um, we expect that the impact will be on the, on the higher end of the spectrum. Um, I'd love to hear from, from someone who, who is in this cluster of stars on the right-hand side. What, what made you say higher impact or what are you seeing or experiencing that's causing you to believe that's how it will play out? 
uh, Jen, are you asking folks to unmute and just provide voiceover yes. or to put their comment? Okay, great. Yeah, if you want to unmute, if someone wants to unmute and share their thoughts or if you want to chat that in, thanks for the clarification, Dan. Um, it would just be great to hear about someone's own experience placing it on the higher end of severity of the crisis. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and talk about social cooperation, but that is definitely something that we'll want to come back to whenever we get into our breakout groups of what your expected future is like and then where you see it going from here. Oh, and I see folks are, are already starting to put down their level of social cooperation. So let me describe this one just briefly. Um, when we talked about social cooperation, Gabriel already mentioned, we don't expect that everyone's going to hold hands and agree on everything all at once. Um, but what we focused on is whether or not people can come together enough to really act collectively. Do we see stagnation and fracturing, like some of the descriptors on the left-hand side, or do we see unity, broad-based action and cooperation as described on the right-hand side? Um, and in our scenarios, we intentionally took a national lens to look at social cooperation, but we also recognize that everyone is operating in a really different future or different environments based on where, who they serve, where they work, what the local structure is, how that relates to state and national. And so we recognize that everyone's really going to have to think about applying this to their own unique context. Oh, interesting. So for this one as well, people are, are putting it towards the middle um, of social cooperation. And so we've got a, a bit broader range over here. Um, and with social cooperation in particular, um, one of the things that, that we recognized is that that's something that can change pretty dramatically and pretty quickly and unexpectedly um, and have a real influence on the social sector. So if we were looking at the business sector or something like that, we might not have chosen this axis, but we felt that this was really critical for getting the work done and getting support into community. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and talk about what we actually saw for the scenario summary. And forgive me while I clear out all of your lovely stars for a moment. Um, so after we had these two axes, we took them and we, we crossed them and we asked ourselves about those worlds. And we certainly don't have time to go into what every one of the scenarios would look like. We've shared the, the report in the chat and we'll share it again. Um, but we did want to give you a kind of quick feel for what it could look like. So number one on the upper left, we call this returned to normal. And we asked ourselves what for example, would it look like if the country came together, but the impact of the crisis was less painful than many people thought. So there we see a return to normal, but it's not all rosy because the pullback to the way things were or just getting back to the way things were is really strong. Um, and that could undermine the opportunity to address some of the deeper inequities that have really been laid bare by the crisis. In the bottom left, you see the social fabric unraveled. So in this scenario, the severity of the crisis is still lower than expected, but we really struggle to come together as a country. And in that future, we could imagine divisions getting deeper and widening and really little reform is being accomplished um, to address inequality or to address some of the other social challenges because we can't agree on either what to fix or on how to fix it. In the bottom right, a nation on the brink. Um, you might want to take a deep breath for this one. Um, in this world, both the crisis and, and the level of social cooperation are both really low. So it's more severe and we fail to come together. And in this world, we expect that things can get worse at a really alarming rate. Um, for the first time in a century, hunger overwhelms many communities. 
Um, and with a social safety net that has large and growing holes, nonprofits and funders are faced with a new level of a scarcity mindset, trying to provide for folks on the ground, but really ill-equipped to meet an astonishing need that communities have. And finally, in the upper right, rising from the ashes. So in this one, we ask ourselves, what happens if the impact of the crisis is high um, and we find ways to come together? And of course, history is filled with examples of people that come together in the face of overwhelming challenges, which is why we describe this as rising from the ashes. There's no denying that in this scenario, there are long-term really harmful effects to our society if the crisis is very severe, both in terms of lives and opportunities that are lost for children, for families, for communities. But it's that very pain and challenge that allows people to push aside longstanding differences towards significant and structural changes. Um, but even though there's a light at the end of the tunnel, um, the tunnel is both long and dark along the way. And so in the report, we talk more about these four futures. Uh, they certainly aren't exhausted or intended as predictions of what the world will look like. Um, but we try to paint that picture of many different trajectories. And we don't know how it will unfold. But what we do know is that it's important to be prepared for really any of them. And so the idea is that we want to help people begin to think about what's the broader range of possibilities and start to imagine how they might respond if they came to pass. So one of the other things that our report does, it's, 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 it, it is an interesting exercise to put yourself in each of these scenarios and imagine what your organization would do. Uh, and, and, and each of the scenarios themselves are quite interesting to consider. But the, the general idea and the most important sort of concept to take out of this is it is able to break out of the tunnel vision single expected future uh, to really see that there are multiple possible futures that could uh, could emerge. And, uh, you know, so 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 we think it's critical for people to really stop and think about each of the scenarios. But the real value of the scenarios is actually going to come from how you adapt the scenarios to fit the specific nuances and contexts of your organization. Uh, so we really recommend four key activities to help people do that. The first one is about making the scenarios your own. So you'll want to tailor the scenarios to your specific context, the people, places, and issues that matter most to you. Uh, for example, one of the most critical uncertainties for education nonprofits uh, we found in a recent workshop we held a few weeks ago is how school districts are approaching reopening this fall. You don't necessarily need to create an entirely new set of scenarios with school opening as one of the axes, but we do recommend thinking about the way that school openings might create very different strategic implications for each of the scenarios that we lay out here and what impact that might have on students and teachers and parents. And so that became really powerful exercise to really try and think about the strategic implications for the issue area uh, that, that, that the different organizations were working in. The second recommendation is around finding your anchors, because in the midst of crisis, it's really critical to think about your core values and really talk through with your leadership, your staff, your board, uh, the assumptions you make to get clear about what you do and don't believe, what you will and won't do. Uh, this becomes even more important uh, as we think about the possible ways the future may play out. Uh, so are there things that you wouldn't consider doing no matter what? What needs to stay fundamental to your work regardless of what's happening in, outside, in the outside world? Uh, and what does it mean to really think about what you can influence? You know, what actions could you take now either individually or with others to promote better outcomes? And those anchors become really important for organizations to think about. The third of our recommendations is, is about stopping to really test uh, your current strategy against each scenario. So how would your mission, your operating model, your fundraising model, your staffing change in each of these scenarios? It's important to test your strategies uh, 
in each of these scenarios to figure out whether the assumptions that undergird them still fit if the future plays out that way. So in the workshop with education nonprofits that I mentioned earlier, one organization had a really critical aha because they realized they were so fixed on our scenario one that things would return to normal that they weren't investing at all in their technology platform. But when they stopped and looked at scenarios three and four, and they really started to think about what it would mean if they needed to remain virtual for a longer time, they had this huge realization that if they didn't start doing some investing in a virtual experience now, they'd be in real trouble down the line, return to normal scenario happen. At the same time, we also talk with organizations about thinking about their robust moves, which are, these are the actions you could take regardless of which scenario comes about. These are uh, things you, you, you can really start to do because it doesn't matter which future emerges. Uh, we talk also a lot about cascading aftershocks. So these are problems that may emerge in the wake of the main crisis. These are things like the potential for homelessness uh, and, a, and a real upsurge in homelessness if restrictions on evictions lapse or the consequences of all the deferred medical testing that's going on during the crisis. So what are the implications of all the mammograms and routine screening that isn't happening right now? Uh, we also encourage people to talk about what we call reset opportunities. These are the bets you can make now to really try and reset the system while the status quo is out of balance. So for example, we know that there's gonna likely to be a glut of commercial real estate available uh, in the coming months uh, as companies realize that people can work from home and many people will be skittish about returning to the office. And what we've seen is some housing advocates have begun to explore how these empty commercial spaces could potentially be converted to affordable housing. And we think there are lots of these reset opportunities that are wor worth paying to. And then finally, our fourth recommendation is around developing a plan for 12 to 18 months but doing it in six month increments. Because more than ever before, we need to be flexible in how we think about the future and how we can adapt as conditions change. We need to think about what are the signals and indicators that you would be watching uh, to help you know whether we're heading towards one scenario or another so we, you can pivot or shift as you need to. And think about what are the decision points or key events that might tr trigger specific actions for you, for example, of the election require you to really think about policy and advocacy in a really different way. So all of these things are a set of, of steps we encourage organizations to do. Uh, and we're going to give a, a little time now uh, as, as we talk with you on this session and give you a little bit of experience of what it's like to do some of that scenario thinking in terms of your own organizations. And we know that not all of you will have read the report, but we think, still think that there's some real value to doing a little thinking about how things could play out. And uh, what's powerful about this is really actually living in the scenarios and recognizing that what you do might be quite different depending on how the future plays out. So what we're gonna do is break you into smaller groups. And of the, the force, we're going to ask three questions. Uh, actually, thank you, uh, uh, Jen. Uh, let me pause here, actually, and ask if there are clarifying questions. Uh, we, will, we, we can have some time in the small groups to talk about specifics, but if there are big clarifying questions anyone has, let's pause here and you can take yourself off mute and we can try and answer them relatively quickly before we dive into small groups. Gabriel, this is Dan. Just one question that occurred to me around the frequency with which you should revisit the scenarios. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, and and we, we think it, it's important to revisit them on a regular basis. That's why we often talk about these six month increments. Uh, it, it is, but watching all the time is a really important thing you can do and looking for the signals uh, that, that would tell you 
whether we're headed one way or another. So if the first time you think about scenarios, you really do a little bit of consideration of what are the signals that might tell you that things have shifted to one place or another, that allows you to, it, it would trigger revisiting, revisiting the scenarios uh, again. So why don't we jump into small groups where it may be easier for people to ask questions if they have it. We're gonna have, ask you to, to really think about three questions when we break into the small groups. The first one is, what is your organization's expected future? Because we know in almost every case, your organization will have one that you've been kind of preparing for. So what is your expected future? Then the second question is, what's the scenario that's furthest from the one that you're expecting and preparing for? Uh, and the third question is about what assumptions uh, about what you do and how you do it would need to change if that, that really unexpected scenario came to pass. So we're hoping to break into small groups. We may, uh, we may have enough people that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to go through a few people and have a few people reflect on their organizations and talk about it. But why don't we go ahead and break into groups and have those conversations. There'll be one person from our team in each of the groups to help out. We'd love to just hear from some folks in the audience some, an idea or a question that arose that you think might be helpful for, for the broader group to, to hear or even a, a, a pondering as you were thinking about your expected future versus um, what might happen. This is Dan. So one thing that just was a, a theme was this kind of across the board, folks were saying, you know, in April, generally they thought this was an event. Um, and as April unfolded into May, there was this kind of aha that we were actually moving into something quite categorically different. So I, one thing that occurred to me and just more of a comment that in some ways it's just, we've had a few months to get our head around that the world may have permanently changed. Um, and what then uh, to do about that? And it, we didn't comment on this, but uh, it was, a sense that the, there's a lot of work before us and how are we stepping into that? And there was kind of a bit of an unknown into how intentional our respective organizations were in, in trying to step into it. And, and Dan, your, your point is an interesting one. In, in, in our prior conversations about this, people often will, will say, you know, we haven't gone to the place of thinking about scenario three or scenario four, the ones where the crisis is worse. And it was interesting in, in, in our small group, several of the people said, yeah, really going to the place of scenario one, because we kind of know that that's not going to be where we are anymore. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting development. And what does it mean to, to no longer think that this notion of a relatively fast recovery is possible? And what does that mean for your planning efforts? Uh, one of the things I mentioned to my group is we, we, we have come to this interesting place where the conversations about a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery or even a W-shaped recovery have been replaced by conversations about a K-shaped recovery because uh, some parts of the economy in some places are recovering very quickly while others uh, are really struggling. And, and uh, But the, the, the idea that we might get a very quick recovery for, for the country as a whole is, is maybe passing. I was just gonna say, we also in our group talked about um, the election being top of mind and how that maybe has shifted kind of the thinking around low versus high social cooperation. And um, I think we talked about this a little bit, but the impact of the election at all levels, nationally, regionally, locally, what is that going to mean? Um, and how that could be more or less important for some organizations. So we were just talking about how you could make your own uncertainties cross your own axes um, to, to make these scenarios more specific to yourself and really use this as a tool sure. for that. Well, and for those who, uh, who, who do have a desire to build your own scenarios, there is a lovely guide called What If, written by, by our former colleague, Diana Scarce. Uh, that is sort of a, a nonprofit guide to scenario planning. Um, 
uh, and and so we can make sure we we send you a link to that document. It can be found on the resources section at the Monitor Institute website, but uh, we'll we'll try and get you all a link. And on that point, Gabriel, something that uh, I, I mentioned in our group is um, it can be very helpful to take these four macro level scenarios and do a bit of thinking and translating it to the particular sector or issue that your organization lives and operates in um, to really play it out and then by doing that exercise, it makes the scenarios not only much more vivid, but also will enable you to then start to pick out things like early indicators of where we might be headed in one direction or the other um, to really make it clear what are the things you may um, need to do differently depending upon how this shows up in, in your own particular context. Absolutely. And as we developed the the scenarios themselves um, and we we got to the end of kind of writing the the stories painting the pictures and came to the conclusion that what we really needed also was what does that mean like what are the takeaways practically speaking um, for those of us at nonprofits or or at philanthropies or other groups um, serving communities and so a couple of those I'll, I'll just highlight a, a few of them um, one is that these multiple compounding crises um, that are resulting in really devastating blows for communities also create the opportunity for fundamental change. And so we touched on this a bit already, but many people we, we talked with described this as a once in a generation or a once in a century opportunity to affect the underlying systems of how, how the world works. And so um, a couple of people even brought up those kind of famous Rahm Emanuel quote that crisis is a terrible thing to waste, um, which we thought summed it up well. And when things are in flux and when the current systems aren't working, having the opportunity to reinvent them is a really valuable um, opportunity. And so how do you meet that need of, of people on the ground, the pressing everyday needs while also addressing the systemic opportunities? Was, was a give and take that many people were grappling with. Um, we also heard that nonprofits and funders live in the same world, but they're experiencing it very, very differently. And so we often talk about funders and nonprofits being in the same crisis, but foundations for the most part, or at least endowed foundations, are among the more insulated institutions in American society when it comes to this sort of crisis. And nonprofits are among the most vulnerable, especially those that don't have large operating um, caches or, or rainy day funds. And so as one of our colleagues put it, um, that that interaction could be awkward at best or dystopian at worst as we try to navigate um, how different groups are experiencing the crisis, even within the sector. Um, and then the third that I'll highlight is that the role of this social sector is really being determined by how the federal, state, and local governments respond. We talked about this in, in my group, but there's no one election or one outcome that would make this determination, but that it's a, it's a combination of many different events and that those, those events will play out very differently in different geographies. And so there's a few other takeaways, but those are the ones that, that really stood out in our conversation today. Um, Gabriel, what would you add on to that? Uh, I'd say one, one other thing, and it's mentioned on here, is that, that how private funders respond really will matter here, right? So we've seen folks like the Ford Foundation begin to, to think about new ways so they can increase their payout rate. What, what private foundations and community foundations and others are able to do will have a significant impact on what the landscape is for nonprofits. Not that, that, that foundations can fill the gap of government funding, uh, but, but the, the choices about either funding immediate needs or funding uh, uh, policy and or systemic change uh, 
increasing payout rate or keeping things relatively the same and keeping your quote unquote powder dry for upcoming crises or cascading aftershocks. Uh, all of those questions will really matter uh, in the coming months for uh, the social sector as a whole. I, I'd love to, with our last couple of minutes, uh, just close by talking a little bit more about what we're continuing to do uh, with this work. Uh, we, we recognize we, we released the report. It is there as a resource for people in the field. But, and we are going to continue to try and share this as widely as possible and help people figure out how to use it. We're also working with nonprofits and funders on workshops to help them apply the scenarios to their strategies, to their issues, to the places that they care about. Uh, so we're looking at working either with individual funders or clusters of funders who care about a particular issue in a particular place and helping them think about scenarios and what that means for what they do or for individual organization nonprofits uh, or clusters of nonprofits you know what can be done to really help folks think about uh, the scenarios in, in a, a coordinated and thoughtful way at the same time we're also doing a lot of thinking uh, i mentioned the idea of this notion of both cascading aftershocks and reset opportunities uh, what are some of the problems that we can start preparing for now rather than getting caught flat-footed uh, by them later? And what are some of the reset opportunities that are emerging where we really could take advantage of this moment, as uh, Jen said, uh, while the status quo is upset, while uh, the crisis is going on, to really think about things in new ways? Uh, and. So, so we have work going along on, on those fronts uh, as we continue to look at these, these topics and we're hoping to be as helpful as possible with uh, both nonprofits and foundations. Uh, and we'll continue talking with uh, Dan and the team at IS about uh, how we can share these ideas and these resources in the field. Uh, but I'd love to just try and leave with a couple of big takeaways, just to try and boil out the most important takeaways that if nothing else, if you haven't really heard or, or, or focused on anything else in this conversation, we'd love to leave you with. So the first is about the importance of not locking yourself in and planning for just one expected future. We don't know how the future will unfold, but we know that the most resilient organizations will be the ones that have a broad array of choices and alternatives at their disposal and are really prepared to pivot between them as the future heads in one way or another. The second big takeaway is about urgency, uh, which is uh, that there's a real need and opportunity for nonprofits and foundations to step up at this moment of need for the country. There's an urgency to act and not be paralyzed by all the uncertainty. It's important to start planning now and not just wait to see how things play out later, because then it may be too late. So our hope is that our tool will be a helpful resource in helping people feel and recognize that urgency. But alongside the urgency, there's also a really important message around agency, because even if we can't control the future, we can influence or nudge it one way or another. And there are lots of things that we can do now and use in this disruption of the moment to really try and shake up and, and push the future one way or another and maybe reset some of these long established systems. And with that in mind, I'd love to leave you with a quote that uh, many of us working on the project have found uh, quite meaningful and quite powerful. It, it comes from a Rebecca, Rebecca Solnit, who is a, a wonderful author, uh, but also has done a lot of thinking about crises and, and emergencies of various sorts. And in a recent essay in The Guardian, she said, hope is not optimism that everything will be fine regardless. Hope offers us clarity that amidst the uncertainty ahead, there will be conflicts worth joining and the possibility of winning some of them. And one of the things most dangerous to this hope is the lapse into believing that everything was fine before disaster struck and that all we need to do is return to things as they were. Ordinary life before the pandemic was already a catastrophe of desperation and exclusion for too many human beings. 
an environmental and climate catastrophe, and an obscenity of inequality. It's too soon to know what will emerge from this emergency, but not too soon to start think, looking for chances to help decide it. It is, I believe, what many of us are preparing to do. And with that, we want to say thank you very much for joining. Uh, and certainly, please feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Uh, uh, we'll stay on until I think the end of the half hour and if people have questions. But thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Gabriel and Jen, very much. And again, I encourage folks to take advantage of this. Or if you need to metabolize it, we can certainly uh, put you in contact with uh, both of them.